Hey there, everybody. This is our last video on nuclear physics. In this video, we're going to learn about nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Um, there's going to be a lot more information than we really need, so don't feel like you need to write everything down today. I'm going to go into a little bit more specifics, um, give you some real-life examples of how we use this stuff. Um, so I'll be sure to point that out and be sure to point out what you need to know. So here's kind of sort of where we need to start, historically speaking. 1938, these two German fellers by the name of Hahn and Strassmann discovered something about uranium. They discovered that if you bombarded it with neutrons, that it would cause it to split into two smaller nuclei, and in the process release a little bit of energy. This was the first notable nuclear process that we discovered besides the natural alpha, beta, and gamma decays. So this is not something that uranium does naturally on Earth. It's something that has to be forced. So here's kind of a picture. Here's a hunk of uranium. Here's a neutron that hits the uranium. The absorption of the neutron by the uranium creates uranium-236, which is extremely unstable. And very, very short time after that, it's going to break apart into two smaller fragments. So I just kind of wrote as an example um, Krypton-92 and Barium-141, but in reality those two fragments could be a lot of different things. And so those two fragments are going to have a ton of energy due to the mass lost in the uranium nucleus, and then there's also some extra neutrons that are created. We might refer to the uh, starting material as the parent nucleus, kind of a term that's used. And then the ending material as fission fragments, or another term that's used as daughter nuclei. So this was a pretty big discovery, because it was a, another kind of nuclear process, and it released a lot of energy. So this process of splitting a nuclei, big nuclei, into two smaller nuclei is referred to as nuclear fission. When you fissure something, that means it splits apart. So a general reaction for uranium-235 might look something like this. A neutron plus uranium-235 gives you two smaller nuclei, X1 and X2, plus some extra neutrons, plus a ton of energy, which is the whole idea here. Again, those two daughter nuclei can be many different things. Um, they're probably not going to be the same thing, as it turns out. Um, but usually one will have about 60% of the mass, the other will have about 40% of the mass. All that we really need to remember is that we have to conserve the nucleon number and the charge in any nuclear process. So if we knew what one of those species is, then we should be able to figure out what the other one is. Kind of the same game we've been playing. Um, real quick fun fact, uranium is the largest naturally occurring element on Earth. Anything that's heavier has to be man-made. So an example of a heavier element that's man-made would be plutonium. Plutonium we can make from uranium. And so uranium is kind of stable, but not really. It's going to decay sooner or later. Anything heavier than uranium, if it ever existed on Earth, has decayed a long time ago. So that's why this process is kind of special for things like uranium. They're heavy and they're unstable. So the next thing we need to know is the idea of a chain reaction. You might have noticed in the picture that we drew a few seconds ago that a bunch of extra neutrons were produced at the end of the fission process. Those neutrons, provided they have the correct amount of energy, can collide with other uranium-235 nuclei, which can cause another fission reaction, and in the process create even more neutrons. So what you end up with is something called a chain reaction. It's kind of easier, I guess, to draw a picture than it is to kind of describe what's going on. But here on the left side, you've got the original event, a, nu a nucle uh, neutron colliding with a uranium-235, you get two products, and then the neutrons from those products can cause fission in other uranium, which leads to more of those fission products, 
plus more neutrons, which leads to even more fission. So you can see how just one nuclear event, one fission event, can cause a whole bunch of fission events really, really quickly. This idea was kind of important. The first time that mankind was able to sustain a chain reaction for uranium was on December 2nd, 1942 at the University of Chicago. And this reactor was built by a guy by the name of Enrico Fermi, an Italian feller we've talked about before. Um, so this is the only surviving picture of that reactor. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're looking at it from the top and the blocky kind of stuff, like right here, is the graphite that he used to control the chain reaction. We'll talk about more, more about that in just a second. Here's a picture of a more modern reactor, um, and we'll talk about what these things are, control rods, here in just a second. Okay, so let's talk some nuclear engineering 101. Don't feel like you have to write this down. This is beyond what we need to know but maybe kind of useful and or interesting to you. In order to make a chain reaction sustainable, we need a moderator of some kind which slows neutrons down. As it turns out, neutrons that are going too fast won't cause a fission event, and so a moderator is something that can slow those neutrons down without absorbing them. And so typically what's used is something referred to as heavy water. Heavy water simply means deuterium or deuterated water. So most water on Earth, you know water's chemical formula is H2O, is um, hydrogen 1, one proton. Remember that deuterium is hydrogen 2, so du for 2. So if your hydrogen in your water is deuterium, then we refer to it as heavy water. You might also write that as D2O. It's a pretty common thing. Um, graphite, like in the last picture, um, is another possible moderator in a nuclear reactor. So it's kind of important to get the neutrons moving the right speed in order for your chain reaction to occur. The next thing that you need are um, control rods. What these things are is they're things that are made out of neutron absorbers, such as boron or cadmium, which can be used to control the rate of reaction. If your reaction's going too fast, that means you're generating too much heat. All those um, daughter nuclei are going too fast, and too much heat in a nuclear reactor is bad. If it gets too hot, it will melt. Melting reactors is very bad. The next thing that you might need for your nuclear reactor is um, enriched uranium. Naturally occurring uranium is only 0.7% uranium-235. And uranium-235 is the stuff that will fission easily. So sometimes, in order to increase the rate of reaction, the uranium is enriched. What enriched means is that we enrich it, like take some other uranium isotopes out, to increase the percentage that is uranium-235. We get more uranium-235 in our um, reaction mass, then the reaction will occur um, a little more faster. So if you're a nuclear engineer and you're designing a reactor, these are basically the three things that you're going to be playing with as you design your reactor. The control rods are what you're going to be using to actually control your reactor on a day-to-day -day basis. And those things kind of have to be adjusted on like a minute-to-minute -minute basis in response to what's happening inside of the reactor. So those things are kind of important. If you lose control of the control rods, you're going to have a bad time. So here's a basic schematic of a nuclear reactor. Here's the part we're interested in for right now. You can see the reactor vessel. These are the control rods right here. And then you just pump hot water through it. The reactor heats up the water, which can then drive a turbine, which can then be used to generate electricity. So we know about turbines. We know about generators and how they work. We know about how hot things go up and cool things go down. So armed with everything we know about physics, 
we can explain the entire operation of a nuclear reactor like this from start to finish. A couple of things that could go wrong. Um, the first thing is something that's referred to as a meltdown, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. A meltdown occurs when the reactor vessel, like the thing holding the uranium, uh, melts or cracks, which lets all that radioactive crap out of there, which in general is bad. Um, there have been three nuclear meltdown events in the history of nuclear reactors, at least that I know about. One at Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. One in um, the Ukraine, Chernobyl. And then one a few years ago in Japan, after a tidal wave kind of knocked out a nuclear reactor. Um, so in general, meltdown's not good. We've got a bunch of nuclear um, radioactive stuff leaking out of it that is uncontained. The other problem with a nuclear fission reactor is the waste products that are created. Um, all those daughter nuclei, those fission fragments that are created, are themselves radioactive. And they have relatively long half-lives, so they have to be stored for a relatively long time. Um, they're basically waste. We have, can't get any more use out of them, and they're harmful to people. And so we take them and we bury them somewhere out in the desert, which is kind of a problem. Um, a lot of people think that a nuclear reactor could be made into a atomic bomb. That's something that's really not true. If you're going to make an atomic bomb, then you need highly enriched uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And then you have to squeeze it really, really rapidly with conventional explosives. That's how you would make an atomic bomb. So the uranium in your typical nuclear reactor is not highly enriched, like what it would be in an atomic bomb, and then you're not going to rapidly ever squeeze it exactly right to make it fission out of control. And so if you were to drop a bomb on a nuclear reactor, the worst thing that could happen would be a meltdown, not a giant explosion. Another fun fact, the first atomic bomb used 140 pounds of enriched uranium. So if you think about 140 pounds, that's about the size of a person, give or take, which is enough when you make it undergo nuclear fission to destroy a medium-sized city. Okay, so here's where you want to pick your pencil back up. We need to know a little bit about the opposite process, which is referred to as nuclear fusion. It's the opposite because fusion occurs when two smaller nuclei smash into each other and create a larger nuclei. I guess I should say nucleus, since it's singular. So here's a common example. Two isotopes of hydrogen, like hydrogen-1 and deuterium, when they collide will create helium-3, so HE3, um, plus a gamma particle, and then again, massive amounts of energy. So the reaction that I've drawn there is one of several, we're going to see most of them, that actually power our sun. So the light coming to us from the sun is right there. Now if we could make these things work on Earth, it would be really, really nice because we could get a lot of power relatively easily from fusion events. So there's a couple of reasons why this would be really, really nice to have on Earth. We can get a lot of the starting materials from water. Deuterium, tritium, hydrogen-1 are all naturally occurring in seawater. The products that we get are more stable than the products from nuclear fission. In fact, we are running out of helium. We could really use more helium here on Earth. There's no way for us to get any more helium, and we're kind of running out. And then the third thing, compared to fission, you get tons of energy out of a nuclear fusion event. Now, some of the problems with this, the energy to actually start a fusion reaction is really high. That's why it only occurs, as far as we know, in the center of the sun. And then the amount of energy that we get out of it is so great that we can't really contain it. Basically, it melts through anything you try to put it in, which is bad because then we don't get power from it. But someday, hopefully within our lifetimes, we will actually figure out how to make this work on Earth. 
And just to kind of complete the picture, talk briefly about how you make a bomb out of nuclear fusion. Um, essentially what you do is you take a fission bomb, like with uranium, um, you bring it near some um, deuterium or tritium, H2 or H3, and then those things will start to fuse and they will release even more energy. A little bit of historical context. First developed in 1952 here in America, um, the Russians quickly figured out how to copy our hydrogen bomb, and most of the nuclear weapons around on Earth today are of the hydrogen bomb caliber. The reason is because they are much more powerful than their um, fission bomb cousins. So, for instance, we've developed a thermonuclear hydrogen bomb that's approximately 10,000 times more powerful than the first atomic bomb that the Americans developed during World War II. And so that's why those are typically what you see nowadays. Not so much seen, but more stored underground somewhere. Some more quick fun facts. Don't feel like you need to write these down. 20% um, of the electricity in the United States comes from fission power plants. Um, last I checked, there were 99 commercial fission reactors in the United States. Just about every uh, major research university is also going to have a fission reactor, but they're not so much for generating electricity, they're more for generating things like neutrons to use in physics studies. On average, a nuclear reactor produces enough energy in a year to replace, and this is going to be a big number, 13.7 million barrels of oil. So in order to get the same amount of energy from oil, we would need 13.7 million barrels of the stuff, which is expensive and has problems of its own. Um, another fun fact, a nuclear-powered ship, for instance an aircraft carrier, could go approximately 30 years without refueling, which is kind of nice. You put some uranium in your boat, you don't have to put any more uranium in, it, uranium in it for 30 years. If only I could get one of those for my car. So just for your information, here is a map of the commercial nuclear reactors in the United States. You may notice there's one eh, relatively close to us here in the Dallas area. That's where we get a good, a good amount of our electricity. Um, if you wanted to look that up, that's called the Comanche Peak Reactor. It's just a little bit south of here. And then there are some fun pictures of some nuclear reactors to end our day with. So we'll look at some examples, um, and I've got some animations of these um, fission processes that we can look at in class. Um, other than that, the big ideas that we need to remember kind of backtracking here real quick. Is that the nucleon number and the charge must be conserved. So really we can answer the questions involving fission and fusion for the most part just by using those two facts in order to figure out what products or reactants are involved. So that's kind of the thing we'll practice next time and we'll see if we can get a better handle on using that in class. So, till then, ta-ta.